via telephone, the real financial Phil. Good morning, sir. How are you? Good morning, guys. How are you all? Awesome. Awesome. Financial Phil from Ameriprise Financial and the Myriad Group of Financial Advisors, Winchester Avenue, where he does work with John Everson and many others as well. And uh, Phil, the first quarter of 2023 was much better than what we saw in 2021 or 22. It, the first quarter was. Now, the last quarter, and I keep, we got to remember, the last quarter of 2022 was also really good. Now, it didn't look the same. The Dow had done a little better. I think the S&P had done a little better. But this time around, the NASDAQ really took off. And the S&P was even up uh, six and a half, six, six and three quarters of a percent. Dow was kind of flat, but that's two consecutive quarters in a row that we've had positive markets. So we can't be oblivious to good news, and sometimes we are. But that is good news. So the longer this upward trend goes, the more solid it makes you feel that it is. Now, we've had those periods last year in, uh, in March in particular, and then we had some, some in, in part of September, that uh, August and September, that we had really good periods, but they didn't last very long. Now, now we're going on two consecutive quarters. So for me, that is a positive thing. It's something to, to, uh, to kind of hang your hat on and say, hey, ha- are we starting to win – this battle against inflation, or more importantly, are we starting to win this battle against the Federal Reserve? Well, can we win the battle against the uh, folks at OPEC? Because they announced they're going to cut production by a million barrels a day starting in a month. And this morning, oil futures are up 6.1%, back above 80 bucks a barrel. And about a week and a half ago, I think we were down around 63 4 5 dollars a barrel for a day, or at least part of a day. It, that is certainly newsworthy, but it's still not, as far as we look on the forefront of inflation, it's more important to pay attention to the jobs number and the CPI and PPI numbers that we'll get beginning in April the 12th. But moving forward into the summer, okay, they're going to cut supply. Now, what will our demand look like? And that's part of what the Federal Reserve is trying to do is blunt our demand some. And, and so will we have the demand that meets that supply? And that will dictate the price of gas at the pump, which we're all afraid about. Uh, that will dictate that. So we're not quite sure yet will the, the, the demand be there like it was last summer to support those prices. You know, we all had complaints about how much gas was, but what we did was we did two different things. We complained, but then we put gas in our vehicle and we traveled and we did. It didn't stop us from doing anything. We just complained about it. So if prices begin to go up like they did last year, will we, will we support it? by still using as much as we did before. In some cases, we have to acknowledge you can't, you can't help it. You have to go to work. You have to, you have to take some of these, these drives that you're doing on a daily basis. But do you have to buy that plane ticket? Do you have to travel? Do you have to drive across the country? And that's where we'll see if, if our demand will support what the price of oil is. Yeah. Uh, Phil, uh, a couple minutes ago you said, can we win a battle against inflation? Can we win our battle against the Federal Reserve? Uh, that, that implies the Federal Reserve has been the enemy throughout this whole process. Thank you for admitting that, Bill, because I agree with you. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, but, and they, they have been uh, from the standpoint, if you're looking at market performance, because their increases in rates has 100 percent been the reason our markets fell for the first three quarters of last year. It fell sharply. I mean, it was deep. And even though, if you want to look back and say, hey, how bad was our market, just look at the NASDAQ. You know, on one hand, you, you could, I guess, technically say, hey, our NASDAQ is back in a bull market. We're up over 20%. We're nowhere near what the high point of our NASDAQ was going into last year. So I, I don't know. I don't know how you, how you, how you vocalize yeah, well, we're up 20 percent, but we're nowhere near what our last, what, what our most recent high was, and so, the, and it is all related to the Federal Reserve increasing rates in order to battle inflation. And whether you agree with what they're doing or not, or like me, I kind of give them a pass because of you know different environment with COVID, and they cut rates so sharply, and then every step of the way when they were going to raise rates, because you know, the big the big debate is, or the big criticism with the Federal Reserve is they cut rate or they uh, increase rates too fast. Well, why did they increase rates too fast? Well, along the way, they started to increase rates, but they were halted by uh, COVID variants, Delta and Omicron, and then even Russia invading Ukraine. It slowed that process down. So once they began, 
they had to be extremely aggressive. So the debate is, you know, should they have increased in the face of Delta and Omicron? And a lot of people say, well, yeah, they still should have done it. But I, I, I get where their mindset was. But those sharp increases has caused all of our issues. It's called the banking issue. It's caused the issue with our markets falling. It's caused all of that. And it still wasn't enough last year to blunt our demand, our consumer demand. A strong consumer has been a problem in the job market. It has been an issue to inflation. In regards to inflation, that has been part of the problem. So they're increasing rates, and, and that's what they're attempting to do is when we get the jobs report this week, can we see some weakness? If we see some weakness, I better markets jump from it. Looking back for the last couple or so years, what would what should they have done different than what they did? Well, clearly they should have. You know, looking back, hindsight's always twenty twenty, but they should have increased in the face of Delta and Omicron and even Russia invading Ukraine. They should have because those threats weren't as what they were afraid of. You know, the original batch of COVID, it wasn't as as damaging to our economy and, and our ability to go to work and, and and spend money, but they didn't because they were unsure of the outcome of those variants and of Russia invading Ukraine, so that slowed them down some. But so looking back on it, and again, hindsight's 2020, I mean, honestly, looking back on it, we should go back to April of 2020. They shouldn't have cut so much. If they wouldn't have cut so much, they wouldn't have had to increase so much. So that was the first issue. You know, we kind of oversteered on making sure our economy would stand resilient through COVID, we oversteered a bit with cutting rates and, and, and influxing our economy with cash. And we continue to do that all the way up to September of 2021. So had we not done that to begin with, we wouldn't have had these crazy rate increases that, like we had last year and, and, and still going on. It's just not as drastic as what it was. But that's the battle that we're facing. That's the water damage that Mitch McConnell had talked about way back in April of 2020 when they voted for these stimulus packages and, and the Federal Reserve cutting rates. Wall Street Journal this morning had an uh, article about the retail investor, mom-and-pop investors are fleeing equities in favor of the more sure things of you know the 4% money market account and such. First, are you, are you seeing that in your own practice, and what's the long-term uh response to that or problems with that we're not but we're seeing questions about it and of course we advise against it and we have to keep in mind that while the risk-free rate of return and that's money market cd that, those are things that have no volatility and there's no risk to it while that's much brighter than what it was a year a year and a half ago it still trails inflation by the same amount so you're still losing value at the same clip as what you were when you were getting one one hundredth of a percent so it's not necessarily a bad thing that you can get a four four and a half percent risk-free rate of return but it's still not keeping up with inflation and it never will it doesn't matter what that they're paying as far as uh, guaranteed returns are it simply doesn't matter it is not going to keep up with the pace of inflation so you do still need to deal with that equity exposure and the volatility of it. And, and even if you look at the last two quarters, where would you have been better off? Would you have been better off in a 4% guarantee? And it wasn't even 4% in the, in the last quarter of last year or with the, with the equity performance that we had gotten. And that's not to say that everything should be in equities, but when you're trying to keep pace with the rate of inflation, hey, I am retired, I need my money to last me another 30, 35, 40 years, it's not going to work. In, in a cash product. It's just not. You will not keep your purchasing power up. And you need that, th these gains like we have gotten in the NASDAQ and in the S&P over these last two quarters, those are critical to your money's ability to last. And it's painful sometimes, and it makes us nervous sometimes. But looking at the, at the big picture, and that's really what matters. If you look at the big picture, we know that it will recover. It's just when will it recover. We don't know when it will fully recover. We don't know over the weekend, the OPEC's going to in, uh, decrease their output, therefore putting more uh, uh, pressure on inflation. You don't know those things are going to happen until they happen. But we do know that the Federal Reserve will win this battle against inflation in, in just a matter of how long. And then when it does, equities will be back in the forefront and continue to move up. Back on Friday, um, a few days ago, I was talking to a friend of mine who lives and works in Manhattan. And she has still not returned to her office, uh, a recently signed, I don't know, 10 or 15 year lease. And the 
they're not going to is is the plan everybody's going to continue to work from home and if you extrapolate out that happening in major cities across the board i foresee this this glut of unoccupied uh and unpaid for once the leases run out uh unpaid for business office space or commercial office space do you see that and what what would the long-term effect on the overall economy be We've been trying to figure that out since COVID because we knew that some things, a lot of things would change throughout COVID. So one, you look at office spaces and people's ability to work from home and how much more common will that be than what it was before. And certainly we're seeing, even though we're not through this full cycle of what COVID has done to our economy and the changes that it has made, we still haven't fully seen it where we, we, we've already seen a lot that said, hey, we plan on just working from home from forever, forever, this will work. But then just as quickly, you, you see the technology company saying, hey, get your butts back to work. We need you in the office. This isn't working. We're not getting as much production out of you. So we're not fully certain yet whether that will be the case or it won't be the case. Their intention may not be to go back, but will it actually work out that way to where longstanding we can do this? So we're not quite sure. But ultimately, we, we know that there will be more people that work, that will be more common especially periods during, say, maybe the flu, where we say, hey, we've seen this before. We can go home and work for a month or so, and everything is fine. But can we do that forever? And I don't know that that question, Jess. Of course, in some circumstances, that that is the case. But in you know, even before COVID, you know, I got a lot of friends that work for the IRS. They work for, from home for the majority of the point for, well, for, for the majority of the time, and they always have. I think work at home is a great thing. It solves a lot of problems, so, so long as you can be productive. Yeah. And, uh, you know, you take traffic off the road. You take the demand for gasoline. But you kill the mom and pop shop. So the Saudi Arabia OPEC uh, contingent doesn't have as much control over yeah. fuel prices. No, the mom and pop shops just adapt like anybody else in business. You Not move in somewhere a business else. district. I mean, if you, well, but you, but here's what's going on in the business districts, though. And I, I know this because it's going on in downtown Pittsburgh, is they're taking these used... There's these unused office towers, and they're converting them to residential, and they're selling them as residential condos at a premium price because it's downtown living, and people are buying them. They're buying them as fast as they can make them, and you know why? Because there's not enough construction in the suburbs to keep up with the demand for houses. So it's business. Business finds a way to adapt, Phil, and make a profit, doesn't it? Yes, it does. In a capitalistic society, it does. So you might have an empty space. And even looking inward, there's a lot of empty, empty spaces in Inwood right now, but a lot of chatter of retail shops and, and, the, and the likes coming in to fill those up. So they can be re, refurbished or recharacterized as something else, and it doesn't have to be just office locations. It could be storage. It could be residential. It could be, like you said, townhomes or condos. It could be a lot of different things. So the, the demand for those, will, will, it, will, it will flush out in some way, shape, or form. So I think that from from the standpoint of real estate, it will still be healthy as it gets to this cycle of increased rates. Because we got to remember, increased rates is putting pressure on a lot of things too: the home markets, uh, home buying, and rental prices that that have continued to soar because of the cost of buying a home now has gone up so much with the cost of borrowed money. And with AI, Bill, no one's going to know if you're at work or you wrote the you wrote the report anyway, so it doesn't matter. That's right. Well, well I, hey, Rob, I need to tell you, if they if they replace you with the robot, I'm out. Not that I'm that important to your to your weekly shows or anything, but I'm not talking to a robot every morning at 6.30 a.m. I, I unload the woes of the world on you every morning at 6.30 before I call in, and a robot's not going to yeah. be prepared to do that and talk about the Pittsburgh Steelers or we go any topic for uh -huh. those five minutes. And I, I need that. I'm not talking to a robot. I'm here yeah. for you. What's the element that you can tell whether it's illusionary or, or real, Phil? The, is I don't know. Response it's, the uh, Steelers? <laughs> <laughs> well, if the Steelers are winning the Super Bowl, that may be illusion. <laughs> but, you know, we d you do look at AI, and, you know, this has nothing to do with the markets, but how technology changes our world. And I'm even thinking from the standpoint of, you know, if you call a – your, your local brokerage firm or your bank and they recognize your voice, can you trust that? You know, as we go on with this chat GTP, and I've seen the, 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 the I don't know what to call it, the, the examples of how it can copy voices, and now, you know, we know all of our client base, 
So if someone calls and says, hey, Phil, this is blah, 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 well, I recognize their voice. And if they need money, I recognize their voice and I send it to them. But now with this AI, do we even trust that when people are mm-hmm. calling in this day and age where you have to be uber sensitive to, to fraud? Now we have to be uber sensitive to fraud with voices as well. So we're going to have to come up with another metrics before long, another metrics of identifying someone aside from their voice. And it may offend a lot of people, but we may have to say, yeah, I've talked to you a thousand times in the past five years, but now I need to ask you a personal question or we have to have some questions on file <laughs> like you do. Like those, some of those silly security questions when you're setting your password, what was your yep. first high school or the name of your first girlfriend or whatever, we may have to have those even to verify a voice. And it's just it's just going to cause hiccups. So along with that, and I'm sure there's good things that will come with this with this artificial intelligence, but there's also bad things. And we're already looking at the fraud of it. And as your last guest had said, they had stopped the free version of it because of so much fraud uh, that was coming along already. And I don't even fully understand it yet. But even in the school system, again, this has nothing to do with the markets. But even in the school system, they have to check now for papers that are being written by chat GTP, yeah. and you can just throw it in there, and it's going to write a paper for you Bill, and read it and make sure it doesn't say anything goofy, but that's an issue that they have to deal with. Bill, before you go on that, I want to just toss this in because we heard a report on this last week that when you get a robocall or whatever on your cell or your, if you still have a landline, they're encouraging you to not say hello until you hear somebody at the other end yeah. of the phone because even by saying hello, hello, is somebody there, that can be recorded and they can use that to copy your voice and create a conversation where they might call Phil and say, hi, this is Bill Stubblefield. Send me all of my money. And it, it'll sound just like yeah. Bill. Yeah. Yeah, that was the example that I had seen. They had taken a news reporter and just taken clips of some of her news reports and recorded her voice and then told the AI what to say. And they called and tricked her very best friend into going down to her car and getting a wallet or something like that. I don't know what it was. But it was just as an example, like, hey, this is my best friend. And they took her, the reporter's voice off of past newscasts and then made it into a completely different conversation. And all they were doing was typing their response, and, and, the, and the AI was giving the answers. And it was scary. You know, on one hand, it was like, oh, look, look how easy that is. And, you know, it kind of made you grin on one hand. But another, someone that's working and, and managing people's money and looking out for their well-being, it made me a little nervous, and I thought, man, how's this going to affect us going forward? And again, I don't know what impact this will have on the market, so I'm getting off topic a little bit, but how our world has changed over the last couple of years in this AI and the chat GTP, and Tyler in our office is all over this stuff, so thank goodness. You know, I don't consider myself old, but he, you know, he's on the young end of this stuff, and he gets it much quicker than John and I do. So we do, we do have to be on the lookout for some of this stuff, and, it, and it's, a, it's a continuing issue that we that we're we're always educated on is how to protect our clients from fraud and we've been fortunate that it hasn't you know we haven't had any issues yet that we haven't caught and this would just maybe be another battle that we have to fight phil let me carry us down a different path for the couple minutes we have remaining uh the chinese have spent a lot of money the last decade or so with their uh, uh belts and road projects and as a consequence they've invested a tremendous amount of money in the uh underdeveloped the third world countries uh they're also making a push trying to replace the dollars with the chinese currency uh do you see any great risk of that? Are you seeing any possibility of that uh, uh, from your perspective? No, not in the immediate future, I don't. The, uh, you know, there's always issues like that, especially with China. And as their economy has grown, they've become more dangerous. But we also participate in that with our trade. You know, they're very important to our economy. So, you know, in the future, may, is that something that we have to be concerned with? Maybe. But right now, it's it's not on the horizon. It's something that we look at as as a concern as it pertains to people's money. Phil, okay. uh, you've talked about this in the past, uh, and this has nothing to do with finances so much as it does to do with insulin. State lawmakers and advocates applauded Governor Justice for signing a bill that would cap the copay for insulin and devices for patients with diabetes. 
This was on Friday morning. SB 577 reduces the copay cap of a 30-day supply of insulin from $100 to $35 and sets a $100 cap for devices such as blood uh, glucose test strips, glucose monitors, lancets, lancet devices, and insulin syringes, too. And uh, uh, West Virginia is the only state that transitioned to an aggregate pay on insulin. A lot of people will take two different forms of insulin, so the cap is per month. If you're taking two types of insulin, it's not 35 each. It's 35 on the aggregate is the report, uh, Phil. And I know you've talked about insulin before and its high cost. Uh, will this help in West Virginia for the average person who needs these medicines? It should, especially those that are on government assistance. It should help. It should help to some extent. The, you know, you got you have your co-pays if you're on private insurance or even PEIA. You have the amount that you have to pay out of pocket anyway. And my wife has been following this much more closely than I have because she controls our insurance. Even though we're licensed uh, to sell insurance, we don't. Uh, health insurance, I should say, life insurance and such, we do. But the cost of insulin, as I see from, a, from my own experience because of my older daughter, these life-saving medications and the have-to-have medications, the prices have continually go up. And it, and it is, you know, I, I stand up on one hand with oil and I say, hey, I defend price gouging to an extent because of the of, of the periods of, of no profit and so forth. But on this, in this circumstance, you're, you're dealing with lives, whether it's EpiPens or insulin. So that should help. But we also have to keep in mind that a lot of these supplies are coming from out of state and I don't know that they can control the prices from from um, insulin that's coming out of state, even if it's being purchased inside of a pharmacy. So who bears that difference from what the manufacturers are charging for the insulin and as it makes its way through the supply chain, who is going to make up that difference? And that I don't know. I'm hoping what you will see is a, a, a reduction in some of our insurance premiums because ultimately what that's going to mean for private insurers that the insurance companies are also paying less. But who it would really immediately impact is probably uh, the the people on government assistance or Medicaid or those those older individuals with type 2 diabetes. But anything that's going to help with the cost of these life-saving medications, I'm in full favor of, even if those private, the people with private insurance don't really see it on a daily basis because they're still meeting their deductibles. If overall it, it helps to uh, relieve the cost of insurance. I'm in favor of it. 1.8 million West Virginians, at least 223,000 have diabetes. Bill, that's a staggering statistic. Yeah, and then when you look at the type 1 diabetes, which is what impacts our families with my oldest daughter, uh, that's never going away. So it's not something that can be controlled. And they do, you know, type 1 diabetic does, a lot of them anyway, does take two different types of insulin, a long-acting and a short-acting insulin. Uh, those on a pump don't, but uh, a lot with the needles and on the uh, on Medicaid, they do. They take two different types of insulin, and it is extremely expensive, and sometimes you can't really help how, mu- how much of it you have to take, and they give you a 90-day supply. So what happens if you, know, if you have a bad period where you have to take more insulin because your blood sugar is running high and you run out? Well, in, in some cases, and we've been there, you have to buy it, you have to pay for it out of pocket. You drop a vial, it's in glass. What if you drop a vial and break it? Oh boy, and I've got a 90 day supply. Well, you're coming out of pocket to purchase that. So, to cap the cost of some of this, I'm in huge favor. Bill, how do we reach you for more information and advice on investing today? You can reach us at 304 263 4343 or stop by and sit with an appointment at 1270 Winchester Avenue, right here in Martinsburg. Have a great day, sir. Thank you guys so much. Thanks, Phil.